So I was thinking of starting with Monday morning pep talk. What do you guys think? Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. So we just took midterm two. And we were talking about this on Friday. The scores dropped from midterm one. The, if there is a silver lining, it's that they dropped across the board in all the Chem 12, 10 classes. So it's not just like our class is about 10% lower on midterm two. All the 12, 10 classes dropped a little bit. Now, we can maybe look back and say, OK, chapters four, five, and six, they're, they're tricky chapters. They're somewhat separate from each other. They're not really tying into one cohesive story. There's a lot of content, a lot of material. But looking forward, I think one thing uh, sometimes happens when a score goes the way you don't want it to go, that is we give up. We don't want to give up, do we? <laughs> no. No, I don't need to tell you guys that because you're still here. So the lecture room is still relatively packed. I like to see that. There might be a few people who watch this after class. I want to give them the message because, you know, we're recording. People might watch this from home. But don't give up if you're at home. Come back to class. <laughs> Okay, but the second thing is to look back and think, think about what went right, what went wrong with your studying, and uh, what worked and maybe didn't work. You know, so I think um, if a lot of your studying was done a week before the test, think about how the two to three weeks before the test, you could have gotten maybe some more out of the studying before uh, the test came up. Uh, another thing is there's this sort of like football analogy I like to think about. That is, um, we sort of have the content, which is like the playbook. You know, so you do you understand the plays? Do you understand the concepts and the content? And then the other aspect is, can you actually go out and execute? Can you actually solve the problem when you see it? And so think about problems that way as you're solving them. Think about whenever you're stuck on a problem, you could say to yourself, where am I stuck at? Is there some piece of content or concept that I'm not clearly seeing? And if that's the case, going back and reviewing a section or two sections, watching a video, doing whatever it takes for you to understand what that missing con uh, a piece of content or concept is, and then come back to the problem and try it again uh, with a fresh set of eyes. Uh, sometimes it's more of a uh, uh, execution issue, where maybe you understand the concepts and the content, you just can't quite see in the problem how to get from point A to point B. If that's the case, you might be looking to you know, check the solution, if it's a quiz, to maybe see how I set the problem up, see if it makes sense with what you know. Uh, maybe watch a video, maybe come to office hours, maybe go to the Learning Resource Center and get some help if you're just stuck on how you get from point A to point B. Once you kind of know your concepts, you can see the problem, but you just can't simply solve it, maybe then you're, you're trying to get some help on solving that particular problem. Now, the last thing I'll say is go back through your test. I know we don't show you the test, and that's probably a bit aggravating, and I'm sorry, it's not my policy to uh, um, not show you your exams. But I do know that a lot of schools are moving this direction under the med school here at OSU, for example. If you go to med school here, almost every test you take, you will never see again. And so it's maybe a fact of life. I think this has been going on in high school, too. So I don't know if this is the first test you've ever taken where you can't easily or go back and review the questions. But you can at least get a uh, summary uh, per chapter of how you were doing compared to the class. So you can see four, five, or six, which one might you need to study a little bit more heading into the final. Um, and then lastly, you can kind of look per question. And just know at the end of each chapter, there's a list of learning objectives. I review these in the chapter summary videos if you want to see a, a video review of those objectives. But they're really just, if you look through each chapter, there's really an objective for every sort of uh, topic or subtopic within the different sections. So the learning objectives, I don't think are all that uh, surprising. The only surprising detail might be just, you know, that we kind of test you on all those objectives. So just kind of keeping in the back of your mind. If there is an objective that you're not, not clear about, Let's try to get some clarity. And you have a lot of different routes through you know, videos, reviewing the textbook, coming to office hours, emailing me questions, whatever it takes to uh, get from point A to point B. OK, so I think that's our Monday morning pep talk. So with that, um, there is a, a question on top hat. I'm going to leave that going for a while. So if you're just coming in, I'll still give you guys a minute or two once we come to the question in the notes. But what I want to talk about at the start of class today are how we determine the electron configurations of ions. Um, and to some extent, this is simple, but then there's a few cases that may not go exactly the way you think they would go. Uh, but we're just going to change the way we think about ion configurations, and then hopefully they'll make sense. For anions, we might think first, when we're, whenever we're doing an ion configuration, we might think, okay, well, what is chlorine with a zero charge? Just to make sure we're picturing that the electron configuration just uh, sort of begins from the uncharged atom. So we might be looking at a neon configuration. 3s2, 3p5. And then if we're adding an electron with a minus charge, we're just throwing one more electron into the shell for chlorine. So of course, that's going to go into the 3p subshell. There's really nowhere else to put the electron. 
other than filling off that 3P subshell. So when we go to CL minus, we're gonna go neon configuration, 3S2, 3P6. So for anions, we're just throwing the electron into the available shell if there's a spot. Now, what if we had something strange? What if we wanted to do the configuration of, say, argon with a minus charge? Not gonna be a stable ion. This isn't going to be something that exists naturally. But uh, if we want to throw an extra electron onto argon, now argon's configuration is the same as the chloride ion. And so the next available configuration would be the next one up, the 4S1. So this would be a neon, 3S2, 3P6, and then the next available subshell would be the 4S. So it kind of has the same configuration you would expect for, like, say, potassium with a neutral charge. Okay, so then thinking of potassium with a neutral charge, where potassium has that 4S1, and just losing that 4S1 valence electron would make the most sense. So what we're gonna find for cations is that they're gonna lose actually whatever orbital's largest. So when we're looking at the configuration, say, of potassium zero, which would be the argon plus the 4S1, we're trying to establish which of those electrons is the largest, the outermost electron. Now, it's going to make sense that these should be the valence electrons that we're choosing from, right? Because the valence, we were trying to define those as the outermost electrons. Um, and so we're going to lose the 4S1 and come up with a configuration for K plus of just simply that of argon. So not too surprising. So you're probably not shocked by that at all. You probably say, well, why would we think it's anything different? Well, as soon as we get into the transition metal block, something kind of interesting happens. Let's look at scandium, um, the first transition metal. Let's imagine it first with a zero charge, so just a neutral um, scandium atom. So that would be the argon configuration, 4S2, and then 3D1. Okay, now of those three electrons, which one of those is the larger subshell? Like which subshell is larger, the 4S or the 3D? It's the 4S. Now you may say, well, how do you know that? Well, one reason why is the N equals four is the size. So this, the size quantum number four is going to be bigger than the entire N equals three subshell. When we were filling in the subshell, we, all, we had done one of these examples where we were picturing the positive charge with the 1S, the 2S, the 2P shell, the 3S, then the 3P subshell. Then we had the 4S, and then we were pointing out how the 3D was then being filled in afterwards. So the 3D was then being filled in to an a, a area that's closer to the nucleus but it's like we had to get the charge a little bit higher in order to pack the electrons in there from uh, the chapter six perspective, yes. Uh, zero minus, uh, oh yeah, um, it's, so could you write the chloride ion configuration just simply equal to argon? Yeah, that would be an acceptable answer. I don't know, um, mastering's always a little finicky on, on choices. You might think that this is probably just like if you're being technical with what mastering might expect since it's real finicky, mastering might want a more technical answer. But saying chloride is equal to argon is, is a fair way to say that's its configuration. So for scandium, if we're gonna lose an electron from the largest orbital first, then scandium plus would have a configuration of argon, 4S1, 3D1. So see how we lost the 4S electron instead of the 3D electron. So the weird thing that happens as we go through the transition metal block is that we're not losing the electrons in the order that we put them in. If you're thinking the order that we were putting the electrons in when we were assigning scandium's configuration, we did like these two electrons and we thought about the 3D afterwards. That we're not just reversing the process for scandium plus. Now for scandium three plus, it's actually pretty easy because we're gonna lose the next two available electrons. So we'll lose the 4S first, if you will, then the 3D. So scandium three plus will have simply the configuration of argon. So that loses all three of the valence electrons and goes to the configuration of argon. Okay, so uh, let's do another example of iron because this is not like a little asterisk. Like this is just the rule for cation configurations is that we're gonna lose the larger electrons first. The way to always get it right is just to picture the uncharged atom first. So just picture iron with the zero charge. That would be argon. 4s2, and then we just have to count across, and we get six across, so that'd be a 3d6. Okay, and so then if we're gonna lose three electrons, the first two are gonna come from the largest orbital, and then the third from the next largest orbital. So it would probably make sense that as soon as we lose the 4s, then the 3d becomes the next bigger subshell. 
So the configuration of iron 3 plus would be argon 3D5. Now sometimes the questions ask, for like iron 3 plus, how many unpaired electrons does it have? Because if we do the uh, configuration wrong, we might get a different count. So sometimes the, a test question or a homework problem might say, well, how many unpaired electrons do we have? And that's just picturing still our five 3D orbitals. And then if we have five electrons and we apply Hund's rule, spin pair them in the same direction across all five orbitals and end up with five uh, spin paired electrons, or you might say five unpaired electrons within this particular ion. So five unpaired electrons for iron three plus. Okay, then we do encounter a slightly different problem once we continue across into the P subshell. So let's look at 10, let's think of 10 zero first. So for 10 zero, that's just um, going down a row, so it's gonna be a krypton configuration, followed by a 5s2, we fill that full D block, and then a 5p2. Now one of the chapter six questions, if you recall, was how many valence electrons does tin have? Four was the answer, right? So we had four valence electrons. So once we filled that D subshell, we weren't even counting it towards the valence. And then if we're thinking of the relative size, the 5s and the 5p, the bigger set of orbitals than the 4d. So one of the ways we can usually, and almost I think always, get our configurations right is if we think about which electrons are the valence, those are the ones that should be lost first if we're making ions. Okay, so these are our valence electrons. So hopefully that helps us uh, sort of remember, we're not gonna touch the D electrons here. We're not gonna remove any of them upon ionization to 10, two plus or to four plus. Now let's do and think of 10, two plus. Which subshell is bigger, the 5P or the 5S? So I think of the 5S and then the 5P is gonna be bigger. So I'm kind of picturing our 5S looks like this and then our P is going to be a little bit bigger. So the P electrons are a little bit further away. Let's come back to physics for a minute. Being further away is weaker attraction. That's really why this is the case. And we're gonna see through some, uh, something called X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, sort of a fancy uh, sort of physics experiment that you can do to sort of prove this to yourself, um, that being further away in terms of electron further away from the nucleus is going to be less attracted, therefore easier to remove. So that's the effective distance here. That's why we're losing the larger electrons is because they have a weaker attraction to the nucleus. So 10 two plus should be a krypton configuration followed by the 5s2 and then the 4d10. Okay, so we've just lost the 5p2 and then 10 four plus, probably not so surprising that we'll just lose the next bigger subshell, the other two valence electrons of 10 so the 5s2 are lost. So we'd have a krypton 4d10 for 10 four plus. Now you see the only confusing aspect here, if you forget about these problems in the future, is just that we have to think upon ionization, we're thinking larger orbitals, that the electrons further away, easier to ionize, first to be removed. And that it's not simply the order that we fill the electrons in. Sometimes when we see this problem, like a week from now, we think, oh, this is some anomaly. This isn't like an anomalous case. This is the rule for all cation configurations. That we're always gonna lose the orbitals from the larger orbitals first. Okay, try to navigate through. We were trying to get through the first um, six sections of chapter five and then come back, look at a few review problems. Then we're gonna look at this thing called X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy uh, today. But let's look at electron affinity because this is sort of the, uh, the uh, almost the opposite, not the true opposite of ionization energy. Um, so electron affinity is the energy associated with an atom absorbing an electron. So if we take F plus an electron, that goes to F minus. So the energy associated with this reaction is defined as the electron affinity. So it's the affinity the atom has to absorb an electron. And some elements have negative affinities, meaning they really would like an extra electron. So if they absorb an electron, their energy goes down. So the delta H for this reaction here would be equal to minus 328 KJs. So F minus would be more stable with the electron in its shell than without the electron in its shell. Now let's do one quick thing and realize that this isn't the opposite of ionization energy. Because ionization energy, if we recall from last time, is the energy associated with losing an electron. So like the opposite of ionization would be F plus absorbing an electron, not F. So ionization is not 
the direct opposite of electron affinity. The delta H here is related to the ionization energy, and you can see if we flip the ionization energy reaction, we don't get the ionization of the electron affinity reaction. If we were to flip the electron affinity reaction, have F minus going to F plus an electron, what might we call that reaction? So that's an ionization reaction, but just of F minus. So this reaction here, this would tell us something interesting. It would tell us the ionization energy, but of F minus, not of fluorine itself. So it would be the ionization energy of the fluoride ion. Now, if you're comparing these two ionization energies, which one do you think would be bigger? Like, which do you think F or F minus would have to have more energy absorbed to lose an electron. So the, the physics thought here, I think, is the number of protons. So if we think of, of F versus F minus, they each share having nine protons in the nucleus. F minus has more electrons, more electron repulsions, bigger ion. It's going to be easier to remove that bigger electron that experiences a less attraction to the nucleus than it would be just for the F atom without the charge. So if we think about how size kind of goes with this trend and come back to where we were at last time, where F, F minus is bigger, F minus being bigger, it's going to be easier to remove the extra electron. If we go back to F, it's going to be harder for it to lose one of its electrons. So what we might predict is that the ionization energy of fluorine will have to be greater. It's actually going to be a fair bit greater than the ionization energy of F minus. Just kind of thinking of the relative scale here. And this just helps us stay in the thought process of thinking of how size relates to electron affinity and ionization energy. Now let's look from left to right. And even maybe just think from left to right for a moment. Like as we're going from left to right, we're going towards smaller atoms that have a more high uh, effective nuclear charge. So probably not so surprising to find that the halogens have the most negative electron affinities from left to right. And it's probably also not so surprising to see that noble gases have positive, or at least nowhere near as negative, uh, electron affinities as the halogens, because they have to put their extra electron in a higher energy subshell. So like the fluorine atom is putting an electron close to the nucleus. It's a small atom, so it's going to be relatively negative when we compare the other elements from left to right. So as we go from left to right, the electron affinities become more negative. And that's until we hit the halogens. And then we get that big jump for the noble gases. So the noble gases are going to have high electron affinities. And then there's a couple weird groups. Like, notice how the nitrogen group, how nitrogen is actually positive. Can you think of any reason why nitrogen might have a positive electron affinity where most of the other elements from left to right have a negative electron affinity? This just has to do with nitrogen has a configuration of P3. So nitrogen without the extra electron has a 3S, uh, 2S2, 2P3 configuration. When we throw it that extra electron and absorbs one electron, then ends up spin pairing it and goes to a P4. And so then that spin repulsion energy, so the energy it takes to pair those two electrons in the same orbital, then kicks nitrogen into having a positive electron affinity. So we have positive or not as negative electron affinities for the nitrogen group. And then something similar happens for the beryllium group. The beryllium group is going from putting, uh, like the element before the alkalis are putting electron in an S subshell, but then beryllium has to put its electron in a higher energy 2P subshell. So we get two or three, if you think about it, groups that have somewhat abnormal um, uh, electron affinities here. And the abnormal electron affinities just have to do with putting electron in a higher energy subshell in the case of beryllium and its group, in the case of spin pairing electron, in the case of nitrogen, or going into a very high energy um, subshell in the case of the noble gases. So probably not so surprising that this is going to be best for the, uh, the, the halogens. So the halogens are going to have the most negative, the most favorable electron affinities on the periodic table. The top to bottom trend is almost non-existent. So there's really no top to bottom trend. So if you examine some of the elements, you can see that some groups go one way, some go another, some invert and decrease and then increase. So there's not much of a top to bottom trend to speak of with electron affinity. 
Um, only thing you might say about size is generally you probably think smaller is better. So if you can put an electron closer to a positive charge, then that's generally going to be you know, favorable. But there's other impacts as well. There's other factors than just that one artifact alone, which is why there's no clear convincing top to bottom trend. Okay, and then we were alluding to this at the end of class last time on how the different behavior um, of the like effective charge, the electron affinity trends, the ionization energy trends lead to the different behavior of the elements across the periodic table. Um, this is why we end up with metals on the left side, nonmetals on the right side, metalloids in the middle, and then they're sharing their properties of on the left side we have more metallic solid elements that uh, are going to have higher melting points and boiling points. Metalloids kind of in the middle, but not behaving structurally like metals do. Like you might think, and we'll go into some more properties of metals versus nonmetals in lecture on Wednesday, but you can probably think most metals you can pound into sheets or stretch into wires. Can't really do that easily with things like boron, silicon, and the other uh, metalloids. Can't do that at all with the non-metallic elements. I don't think you want to take a diamond and try to make it into a sheet, right? You're just going to destroy a precious diamond. So our, um, our non-metals then have a different set of properties as well. Um, usually lower on the boiling point and melting point side, especially when we're on the far right. So the noble gases exist as gases at room temperature, whereas many of the other elements can exist as solids um, and a couple as liquids. The only two liquids being bromine and mercury. So we can get some trends from left to right in terms of the behavior that leads some elements to behaving more metallic, others as more um, non-metallic. So our increasing metallic character is actually towards the opposite end of helium. So helium's a gas, non-metal. So if you go away from helium to the left or down, then you're approaching being more metallic. So our metallic character is increasing to the left side of the periodic table and increasing downward. So you can think, okay, we're just going away from the top right, which is the non-metal side, like the helium side of our periodic table. Okay, so let's come to this problem from last time. This is kind of a review of where we were at last time we were thinking of size. Let me give you guys another minute here to get your answers and think about this problem. Check with your neighbor if you want to review this problem. All right, good job. So the, this is the, sometimes if we forget our trends, we might get this backwards sometimes, but our atomic trends are used whenever the charge of the atoms are identical. So if we're comparing the size of potassium with a zero charge and chlorine with a zero charge, then we just use our left to right trend, that our size is decreasing um, from left to right. So we get a decrease from left to right in size, and then we get an increase from top to bottom. We could also use that trend if we were comparing peculiar ions that don't sometimes make sense. But if we're comparing the size of, say, K plus and Cl plus, any time the two ions have the exact same charge, we can use our periodic left to right trend. Okay, so the decreasing size left to right, increasing from top to bottom. So that leads chlorine to being smaller than potassium. And then for these two, we're just noticing that K plus has 18 electrons because it lost one of its 19 electrons, and Cl minus uh, has one more than chlorine, so it has 18 electrons as well. So these are isoelectronic. K plus has more protons to pull the same number of electrons in. So whenever the electron count's the same, we look to the number of protons within the nucleus. Okay, so that leads to answer C for K plus being smaller than chloride. Let's do one more top hat problem for now. 
This is trying to think back now in terms of effective nuclear charge. So the electrons in which subshell of a ground state zinc atom experience the lowest effective charge? So this is kind of thinking about the ionization, but now in terms of effective charge of which subshell experiences a lower effective charge and therefore is going to be lost first upon ionization. So how many unpaired electrons does zinc 2 plus contain as well within this problem? So give this one a couple moments. One more minute. Okay, so let's take a look at this one here. So one of the ways we might think of effective charge is we could try to consider what might be the effective charge that each subshell experiences. Like which subshell of zinc experiences the highest nuclear charge? It's going to be the 1s, right? The, the, the subshell closest to the nucleus is going to experience the highest effective charge because it's closest to the nucleus, then the next biggest, then the next biggest, then the next biggest. So this isn't too shocking so far. So the 1s closest, then the 2s, then the 2p, then the 3s, then the 3p. Um, and then is where we have the difference between the 3d being closer to the nucleus and then the 4s. That we just have to think here that the 4s is going to experience the lower effective charge just by virtue of being the biggest. So we just have to think of the relative size of the subshells, which goes against the order that we were kind of thinking of filling in the electrons for zinc, because we were filling or thinking of filling those in then this, but we're thinking of removing them in order of this, then the D if we need to remove more. Now, one thing for zinc that's interesting to point out is how we would probably say, I think the best answer for the um, valence count would be two. That we'd say zinc zero has two uh, valence electrons. And then the two electrons it loses upon ionization, of course, are the 4s2 electrons. And then it leaves behind a filled 3D subshell. So if you thought, that we had a 4s2, 3d8 configuration for zinc 2 plus, you may have thought we had two unpaired electrons here. So if you were thinking two unpaired electrons, it's because you were probably removing the electrons from the improper subshell. So we're going to lose the 4s subshell and then make a 3d10 configuration, which has zero unpaired electrons then. OK, now this topic here is um, hopefully one that can give us some clarity. It's not exactly a topic I expect 
us to fully understand. So the, the, I just want to give a couple bullet points of what this t um, technique or an experimental uh, experiment that we could do called X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy is where uh, we could take any substance we wish and um, sort of hit it with X-rays. Generally, we do this in the gas phase with a gaseous atom. So we're going to take gaseous atoms. We're going to choose within this topic to talk about elements. You could do this with molecules if you were you may be doing this with materials if you're a material science major. You can apply this technique to other things than just atoms. But we're going to talk about how we take elements and can understand or learn something about the elements from doing this type of experiment by hitting them with x-rays. And then what you try to do is analyze the electrons that are given off as a result. So an x-ray is a, a large amount of energy. So that x-ray has enough energy to start removing the electrons from the atom from all of its possible subshells. So when an x-ray hits and transfers energy to an atom, an electron can be emitted, and the kinetic energy of the electron is basically whatever energy is left over. If you imagine you have a huge amount of energy in terms of a photon, and it hits an atom that has a small ionization energy, uh, you lose the ionization energy, and then the electron's given off with whatever the difference is. So you might think of, think of it this way, that your x-ray has a certain amount of energy, and then it's going to take so much energy to remove an electron, and then whatever's left over goes into an electron that flies away and is then detected and analyzed. OK, so the uh, photoelectron effect is being observed here. We have one electron that's ejected per x-ray photon that interacts with the atom. So meaning one x-ray photon comes in, removes an electron. That one electron is then analyzed. And this is just done many times. You know, There's just a lot of different x-rays that come in. Um, and then there's a lot of different electrons that are ejected. And so what we're really doing is trying to count like how many electrons of particular energy are observed. Uh, so we uh, sort of look at the energy and the intensity of the emitted um, electrons. And so these experiments, like the, it seems as if the, the, the source where I got some of these spectra from has been removed and I can't find it anymore. But um, there is some information. I just happen to not be able to find it. This link doesn't exactly lead to what it used to lead to. But um, let's take a look at a couple. What I really want to do is just kind of show how we learn of, uh, as scientists about these different configurations that can analyze and make sure that we're correctly determining the ionization energy trends from left to right. So if we look at hydrogen versus helium. So hydrogen versus helium, the two things you might think from what we've taught you so far is that hydrogen should be bigger in size. So the radius, the size of hydrogen should be bigger than helium because size decreases from left to right. So the radius of helium should be smaller than that of hydrogen. And then by virtue of the effective charge being higher, so the valence electrons of helium are not just closer to its nucleus, but the new nucleus is also higher in charge, are going to make its electrons more attractive, you would think. And that's exactly what we uh, will observe here, that the ionization energy we expect for hydrogen will end up being lower than the ionization energy of helium by virtue of helium being more highly charged and smaller, makes it harder to remove its electrons. So you can sort of verify this with this technique of this XPS that it's sometimes called for the X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. So this XPS spectra of hydrogen shows one electron uh, ejected. It has a particular binding energy of about 1.31. I think the units here are megajoules per mole. So it's a weird unit. But the, the, what we're actually seeing here is the binding energy. And that's kind of helpful. Like, we don't have to do any arithmetic. We don't have to know what the energy of the x-ray was. We don't have to do any math here. We're just being shown the binding energies directly. So that when we compare to helium, and we notice that the binding energy has gone up, now it's 2.37, that the binding energy is higher because the ionization energy is higher for helium, kind of verifying our prediction that we have from this chapter. So we see that the binding energy of helium is higher, meaning its electrons are more tightly held onto. So this is just an experiment that you can do to sort of verify what you believe to be the case for elements like hydrogen versus helium. One tiny little detail that, uh, that we also get, it's hard to see, but you notice how the area under the curve of helium is a little bit bigger than hydrogen? That's because we have double the number of electrons that could have possibly been ejected. So we have twice as many electrons that could be ejected from helium, so the intensity is a little bit higher. Now that, that's a little bit when we start looking at some bigger elements. So when we look at, say, lithium, versus beryllium, we start to notice that we get one electron given off versus two. Now let's think of the binding energies here. Because what we're seeing for lithium is it's 1s2, 2s1. Kind of looks backwards 
if you, if you just think from like left to right, you think, well, why, how do we know it's a 2s, uh, how do we know that these are the two 1s electrons and this is the 2s electron? Well, think in terms of binding energy. Think of which electrons would be harder to remove, the 1s or the 2s? Probably the 1s, because the 1s is going to experience a higher effective charge, they're going to be closer to the nucleus, going to be harder to remove. So they should have a higher binding energy, we would expect. And their binding energy is higher. And then if you also think of that binding energy versus hydrogen and helium, hydrogen was on the order of about one, helium on the order of about two, this is on the order of about six. So what we have, the 1s shell, is experiencing a greater effective charge, even closer to the nucleus. You could think the 1s shell of hydrogen versus the 1s shell of lithium, which one's smaller? It turns out to be lithium. It kind of maybe goes against what you might think. You might think lithium would have a bigger um, nucleus, but it really doesn't quite have a bigger nucleus per se. The 1s gets a little closer to that charge because it's higher. So we might be able to reason out that the 1s subshell of lithium should be smaller than the 1s subshell of hydrogen, just by virtue of that effective charge going up and pulling that subshell in closer. Now, that doesn't make lithium smaller than hydrogen, of course. The size trend of hydrogen to helium to sodium, our size goes up from top to bottom. So the 2s of lithium ends up, of course, being bigger than the 1s of hydrogen, meaning lithium's bigger in radius than hydrogen is. So we can compare the 1s to the 1s size. We could also compare the, the, the size of just hydrogen to the size of lithium or the size of the outer valence shells of those atoms. So lithium is bigger than hydrogen, but the 1s of lithium is smaller, closer to the nucleus, more highly charged, binding energy is higher. Then we see the 2s subshell um, is going to be of a lower ionization energy than that of hydrogen. Remember, our top to bottom trend for ionization energy is that ionization energy drops from top to bottom. The explanation being that we talked about last time being that generally you now have a bigger atom, electrons further away, going to be easier to ionize it. It's worth pointing out that hydrogen has a really humongous ionization energy compared to the other um, alkali metals, or compared to the alkali metals. Hydrogen's, of course, not one of the alkali metals. Um, hydrogen's ionization energy is about 1,300 kJs per mole. That's off like a chart in the textbook. You can see that. There is an ionization energy chart we went over. Hydrogen's humongous, and then the other alkalis, much lower. Uh, sodiums, we specifically mentioned sodiums was like 496. We mentioned that on Friday. So the other alkali metals are about 500 kJs per mole in terms of their ionization energy. So hydrogen's ionization energy is about two and a half times that of the other alkalis. So that's one of the big reasons why hydrogen's going to behave or does behave a lot differently than the alkali metals. So we see that drop in ionization energy due to the lowering of the binding energy for, um, for lithium. Now when you think of uh, beryllium, it's just the next neighbor over from lithium, what changes for beryllium? smaller, effective charge goes up. So what we find is you have a higher binding energy for that 2s subshell of beryllium. So the ionization energy of beryllium is higher, the binding energy of the 2s subshell is higher. You can also see that the 1s2 binding energy has gone up as well. So the 1s2 binding electron for beryllium is now higher, and then the 2s2 binding energy is also higher. Now let me point one thing out that may not be super obvious. That every single time that an X-ray comes into any of these atoms, it's removing just one electron. It's not removing simultaneously all the electrons from each of the atoms. It's just coming in and it either knocks out, it either kind of hits the atom in the right spot to knock out the 2s or the 1s. And depending on which electron gets ejected, um, it goes off with the energy that's you know th that corresponds to that particular electron. It either flies away with the energy corresponding to the 11.5 binding energy or the 0.9. And you can also still see the integrated areas of the two to two, so about the same peak height for these two peaks in beryllium, uh, but then you see the two to one. It's kind of hard to see, it's not super zoomed in, but the area under the curve of the 2s1 electron is a little bit smaller than the area under the curve you can see for the 1s2. So you're getting a relative count of the electrons from the area under the curve. Okay, so let's just look at on this slide, four more of these, because we're just going to go from, and it really is just the same two again, so we just see lithium and beryllium on the top for comparison's sake. So two new elements here, boron and carbon. And so boron is just the next neighbor to, um, to beryllium, 
Now, what, what, I, what I have to show here is an explanation. Remember how we were leaving off last time with how the MP1 and the MP4 ionization energies weren't as high as we suspected? If you remember, the left to right trend for ionization energy looked kind of like this. Do you guys remember that sort of general trend that we were seeing? And so if we're going from lithium to beryllium increasing in ionization energy, the question might be, why do we get the drop in ionization energy for boron? And then it picks back up for carbon, nitrogen, then drops for oxygen. So can we come up with an explanation for why we see this particular trend in ionization energy? We can kind of pick it apart here when we look at boron versus carbon. And so when we look at boron, we see the 2s, uh, excuse me, the 1s2, the highest binding energy electrons are the closest subshell to the nucleus, so the 1s2. And then the next is the 2s1, or excuse me, the 2s2. So the next closer subshell of the nucleus is the 2s2, and then the 2p1. Okay, so a couple of things we can see here. One is notice that the 2s subshell is, of course, smaller than that of beryllium, and it's experiencing a higher charge. So it's not so surprising to find that the binding energy, the 2s subshell, is higher than that of the 2s subshell of beryllium. Okay? So when we think of left to right trend, the 2s subshell, the energy it takes to remove a 2s electron, is going to increase without any, so if we're just looking at the ionization energy of the 2s um, electrons, that's going to increase with energy from left to right without any sort of periodic inconsistency. The issue for boron is that its outer valence electron now is a p subshell. So notice that the p subshell has a lower binding energy than the 2s subshell of beryllium. So when you compare the outer 2p1 uh, electron, it turns out that it's easier to remove than that of beryllium. Well, why might that be the case? It turns out it's simply because the 2p is a little bit bigger. So we're comparing, when we compare the first ionization energy of beryllium to boron, it's kind of now turns into not even an apple to apple comparison. It's like you're saying, what's the energy it takes to remove a 2s electron versus a larger type of electron in a 2p subshell? It's probably not too surprising that a larger type subshell is going to require a little bit less energy to remove that type of electron. So that is why we have a drop here. So we have the NP1 being sort of lower in expected ionization energy because the electron is being removed from a higher subshell. If we compare the energy it would take to remove an electron from an equivalent subshell, the energy goes up exactly as we would expect. So I'd said before that ionization energy, it's almost as if we only even talk about this to come up with an idea of how does like charge and size interact or relate together. Ionization energy is one way to make that comparison. But you see there's just a nuance here. So there's like a nuance with this trend that when we go from beryllium to boron, we get a little bit of a blip in our trend because now we're not really looking at the same type of subshell losing an electron. Then when we move to carbon, move to the next element, and it continues to go back up again with the trend, and that's because the 2p subshell, the outer electron for carbon compared to boron, carbon's smaller, more higher uh, effective charge, so we continue the expected trend then. So as soon as you're removing still a 2p electron versus another 2p electron from boron versus carbon, the thought is carbon's smaller, higher effective charge, more energy to remove its outer 2p electron. So we continue this trend as we would expect for all the elements on the periodic table. Then when we get to the oxygen group, it's going to be spin pairing is going to be what lowers that energy for oxygen. But then when we can pick up from fluorine to neon, they have the same spin pairing issue, but smaller atom closer to the nucleus, so we continue the trend. So when we look at oxygen's configuration, the configuration of our NP4s, so we notice that this trend occurs at the, the P1s and the P4s. The NP4 configuration would have the configuration two spin paired electrons, two unpaired electrons. It's not going to take as much energy to remove a spin paired electron. <laughs> I have a slightly better way of thinking of oxygen. I'll do that on the next slide. So let's think more about oxygen and kind of summarize um, some of our thoughts. But first, just reminding ourselves that as we go from left to right, that this ionization energy trend, where the ionization went up, dropped, went up, dropped, went up, that that's not coming about from the effective charge changing with that trend. The effective charge increases from left to right without any inconsistency. The size decreases from left to right without any inconsistency. The issue here is just the subshells that we're moving electrons from 
whether or not they're from a high energy subshell or whether they're from a spin paired subshell. So let's put it together this way here. One way I like to think of this is almost to think back to the Bohr model for like two seconds, just to sort of picture for hydrogen. Let's think of hydrogen real quick. So you have like a 1s, remember the 2s, the 3s, the 4s. Like you can imagine the ionization energy of hydrogen is simply a factor of what orbital that that electron resides in. So if you have an excited hydrogen atom that's all of a sudden put, puts this electron up into the 2s, it's not gonna take as much energy to ionize hydrogen out of a 2s as it would from the 1s. Does that make sense? So like the higher the energy of the electron, the less energy it's gonna take to remove the electron. Because all we're trying to do is get up to this energy here, then all of a sudden we're ionized. Like if we absorb enough energy, then the electron can fly away, then we have an H plus atom, and we have the, uh, the electron flying away. So it's like all we have to do is give this difference of energy, then we can ionize the atom. So it depends on the configuration that the atom's in in terms of how much energy it takes to remove an electron. So now if we then think of how that applies when we think of like lithium, so if I start here with like lithium, with a 1s, let me write our simple thing, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. I'm just gonna stop at oxygen for this trend. And so if we're looking at the 2s subshell, the issue is that it's almost you could picture that the subshell drops in energy. Why would it drop in energy? Closer to the nucleus, higher charge. So closer to the nucleus, higher charge. So the energy it takes to remove the 2s2 electrons, one of the electrons from the 2s subshell from beryllium is gonna take more energy. So you can think of this energy here is higher for beryllium, so it takes more energy to remove that subshell. And then this is just gonna continue and follow suit for boron being lower, carbon being lower, nitrogen being lower. Okay, and let's think of oxygen in a minute. But these are just the 2s2 subshells going down in energy because they're moving closer to the nucleus that's now higher in effective charge. Now what happens for boron is that then you have the 2p subshell and that electron's now higher in energy than the 2s subshell was of beryllium. Do you guys see that small little deviation there? So the issue here is that the 2p subshell is higher in energy. So this electron here is just now in like a higher energy space than it was for beryllium, so the ionization energy simply drops compared to borons, uh, compared to beryllium's. So we're getting the increase in ionization energy, then a drop, and then when we think about carbon compared to boron, now the 2p subshell, smaller, closer to the nucleus, lower in energy, more energy to remove the, the 2p electron from carbon. Same thing happens to nitrogen. Mostly with me through this sort of thought, that the 2p is just getting closer to the nucleus, harder to remove those electrons, so then we go back up. And so then the issue here has been pairing for oxygen, so the 2s goes lower, two of the 2p's go lower, and one of them goes higher. So the spin pairing one goes higher in energy. It's all of a sudden no longer degenerate the same energy as the other two orbitals with the spin unpaired electron. So oxygen goes higher, this is due to the spin pairing energy. So it takes energy to pair up those two electrons. That causes that orbital to be higher in energy, lower energy to remove those two electrons of oxygen. And then when we move to uh, fluorine, you just continue suit here, 2p, electro, well, the, let me make one change here. So the thing that changes for fluorine is we now have two orbitals that have two pairs of electrons in them, and then one with just one electron, and then we have the 2s with two electrons. So the 2s, 2p5, and then these electrons here, a little closer to the nucleus, so fluorine continues to go back up, same thing through neon. So a nuance with the trend, we can explain the trend why we get these two blips. So we get the blip here, because we're moving from the 2p subshell, which is higher in energy than the 2s, and then this here is going uh, sort of down because the uh, uh, spin pairing energy. So we get this inconsistency in this group throughout the periodic table. So if you go back to the chart we're showing uh, ionization energies, we see this in every row of the periodic table. Then we get this slight bit of inconsistency, but in groups of elements. Now let me show you just one sample test question, because you might be sitting there thinking, okay, like what on earth are we gonna ever see? I think this is like probably one of the harder questions we've ever asked, and this is a pretty easy question if you think about it. So we're shown here the photoelectron spectrum of uh, aluminum. 
And so then what is the approximate binding energy of an electron in a 2s orbital? Okay, so for this particular question, what we might be thinking is, well, what's the configuration of aluminum? You know, like a 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1 for its configuration. So you might be thinking of a configuration. And then which subshell should have the highest binding energy? Is, so it's like either going to be this one or, or this one, right? So which one has the higher energy in terms of binding energy? Which electrons are more held on to? So the 1s is the higher binding energy. What has the next lowest binding energy? The next bigger orbital, the 2s. So we're basically saying if you want to find the binding energy of the 2s, you're just going to find, okay, this is the 1s, and then this is going to be the 2s. So the binding energy is going to be, whatever that is, about 13, or no, let's see, that's about 11. Of these choices, I think 11.7 would come closest to that binding energy. I think it looks closer to 12, but of the choices, that's gonna be the closer binding energy. And then notice how this is bigger. That's our P, that's our 2P6. So it's bigger because there's more electrons in that subshell, so there's more electrons that could possibly lead to that signal. And then we get uh, the 2s2 and then the 2p1 with the lowest binding, or the 3s2, the 3p1 with the lowest binding energies. So we don't expect you to know every detail about X-ray field electron spectroscopy, but this is just a experimental technique that allows us to understand and comprehend electron conf configurations and then understand how we actually determine some of these configurations and validate them experimentally. Now, the, if there's any reason why I'm telling you this, it's just for this one slide, okay? Like, so if, if I could have just gone to this slide and introduced the topic and then skipped all that mumbo jumbo and just gone over the spin pairing versus the higher energy subshell, I probably would do that. But you can see experimental data helps us lead into those conclusions that we were drawing. But then I want us to come back to scandium with that configuration that we were looking at, like why the scandium plus would have the configuration of the 4s1, 3d1, and not 4s2. We can see that when we look at the relative binding energies for scandium. So notice potassium has uh, the highest binding energy, 0.42, that's its 4s1. And so then when you're looking at the 4s versus the 3d, notice how it's the bigger peak height of the one on the left side, that's the 4s2. So this is our 4s2 for scandium, then that's the 3d1. So do you see clear, clear as your eyes can see that the binding energy of the 4s2 is weaker? So the 4s2 electrons are bigger, their binding energy is pretty close to the 3D subshell, but it's lower than the, the 3D subshell. So that helps us establish why scandium has the configuration of argon followed by 4S1, 3D1. So you're just seeing in terms of binding energy with experimental data why it is that we would say that the 4S bigger than the 3D, so it's going to be lost first upon ionization. It's because it has the lowest binding energy. So you can work out um, electron configurations or see how we arrive at some of those through experiments like these XPS experiments. Okay, um, maybe I'll pick up from these next time to go over these configurations. I just wanted to, if I could take two minutes, like I think this is just kind of interesting. This is some, some of the pictures from work I did when I was in grad school. So when I was in grad school, I did work on what's called like molecular beam reaction. So I tried to study uh, preparing molecular beams of molecules, colliding them together, trying to see what happened. Um, this is one of the apparatuses that we would use. This is a humongous vacuum chamber that we would pump down to like super low pressures. I mean, it would take, once we were done for the day and we wanted to just vent the chamber, it would take like 20 minutes just to come back to atmospheric pressure. That's how, how low we get the pressure. We get that region down to like 10 to the minus six tor. Um, so really low in terms of pressure. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out is how we were making these molecular beams. We had this like nozzle that we would uh, sort of fire uh, like a charge through and it would like let some gas out and pulses. So we make these like pulse beams and we would get these things called like supersonic expansion where the beam like cools itself. We'll talk about in chapter 10 how if you have a gas sample, then it has a very wide range of velocities. But when you make a molecular beam, what you end up with is a very narrow um, sort of region of energy that the molecules have. So you make sort of a beam of molecules where most of the molecules are traveling with a very similar velocity. So it's like you let out some of this gas in a vacuum chamber, just like flies through the chamber, then you try to do the same thing and cross the beam with another um, set of reactant. That I just find, like, you might not find this fascinating because there's a lot of lasers, but this is using lasers. And what we were trying to do were things like making hydroxyl radical 
so it can react with something like deuterium so we could actually just make water. We're trying to study a very simple reaction. But one of the products that we were detecting was simply something like a hydrogen atom. Deuterium, of course, is just one of the isotopes of hydrogen. So the way we'd go about detecting hydrogen using a scheme that we probably can recognize from this class. What we were trying to do was we were exciting the atoms with a laser to like a 2P subshell, and then from there to a 40S or a 40D. These, these are like high like Rydberg states. These are like almost ionized H atoms, but not quite ionized. And so then we could then um, sort of flow them and have them hit a detector and very exquisitely count these atoms. But the one thing I wanted to show you guys that I think kind of relates back to chapter six and where we're at here is that we were trying to create H atoms that were almost ionized, but not quite ionized. And we were exciting them all the way up like n equals 40. So like in case you were wondering in the Bohr model, we go from two to three to four to five. We were exciting um, to really high, what we call these things, Rydberg states for these H atoms, nearly ionized. And it allowed us a, rare, uh, a really sort of, uh, uh, sort of careful technique for counting the number of H or D atoms um, sort of generated in these types of reactions. I just wanted to quickly show you guys like how I was using some topics from chapters uh, six and seven in my uh, graduate work. So that's all for today. Sorry if that went a little bit long, but you guys have a great afternoon. See you on Wednesday.